made that promise to myself that I would never drink, but I did start drinking. And I saw within a couple of years how quickly my drinking was not just a couple of drinks here and there, but I always tried to get solidly drunk. It was in my um, university years where I saw if I want to go to school and do well in school, I can't drink. This is just not going to work. It, it, I actually started to um, not quite fail, but you know, when you're in a program where you better quit that course or else you'll fail, I would have to do that. And I didn't want to keep having to navigate that. So I stopped drinking. So then when I stopped the alcohol, I then started eating instead. <laughs> and that That took me down. So when I think what started first, I think it was the alcohol. But what brought me down, brought me to my knees, begging for mercy, was food. Welcome to the Tribe. This is your weekly podcast from Tribe Sober. Whether you're already sober, striving to be sober, or just plain sober curious, you need a tribe. You need a tribe because it's so hard to do this alone. You need a tribe because you need support. And that's where we come in. Here at Tribe Sober, we've got your back. Here at Tribe Sober, we have people at all stages of the journey, all helping each other to stay on track. On this podcast, we've got recovery stories to inspire you, experts to inform you, and plenty of advice on how to ditch the drink and change your life. So here's your host, Tribe Leader, Janet Gorond. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Tribe Sober Podcast, episode 169. My name is Janet Gorond. I'm the founder of Tribe Sober, and I'm your host for this podcast. Here at Tribe Sober, we help people to change their relationship with alcohol and then to go on and actually thrive in their alcohol-free lives. And over the last seven years, we've helped thousands of people to do just that. We created Tribe Sober because we know from experience that it's really hard to change your drinking habits alone. So at Tribe Sober, we're all about community. And each week we feature a community voice, just to give you a flavour of the awesomeness of our tribe. Now I had to recondition my mind to start thinking about other things. And that's what the, the, you know, the workshop taught me, that... I'm going, I'm going to make, have to make a lifetime change. I'm going to have to change my mindset. I'm going to have to do things differently. I, I have to shift everything in my life in order to make that change. Um, I didn't change things immediately. It took a while. I, you know, I sat for a while just not drinking, but, but I didn't change anything. Everything was still the same. I started buying non-alcoholic drinks. So instead of lounging with my bottle of alcoholic wine. I'd be lounging with my bottle of non-alcoholic wine. Um, yeah, it took, it, it took some time, but the workshop made me realize that it's, it's a long journey. It's a lifetime process. I mean, it's not, it's not a quick trip. You're not just going to go there, be sober, and that's it. It's, you have to work on it for a long time. Everybody has to figure out how you're doing it, and you have to just stay on the path, do it just every day. So if you'd like to join our warm and welcoming community, just go to tribesober.com and hit join our tribe. On Monday, 5th of June, we begin our fifth five-day free boot camp on our Facebook group. Five days of tasks, trainings and connection, all absolutely free. We have more and more tribe members finding us via our free boot camps. They quit the booze and usually join Tribe Sober to stay connected and keep on track with their sobriety. All you have to do to join is to go to the Sobriety Bootcamp Facebook group and you're in. And I'll see you there. My guest this week is Dr. Vera Tarman, who's a specialist in addiction behaviour and treatment. Dr. Vera is internationally recognized for her education in and publications on various areas of addiction and more specifically food addiction. There are a lot of parallels between food addiction and alcohol addiction. So even if you don't have any issues with food, please keep listening. Vera had her own issues with alcohol, but when she stopped drinking, she started eating until her weight rose to 250 pounds. It was the eating addiction that brought her down, as she puts it, brought her down to her knees. 
I began our interview by asking Vera to introduce herself. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to this podcast. My name is Dr. Vera Tarman. I'm an addictions physician. I work in Toronto, Canada. I'm the medical director of three residences uh, where we treat um, alcohol, drug, and any other addiction. And I've been doing that for the last 20 years. So can we start off by talking a little bit about yourself? I think you had quite a difficult childhood, didn't you? And left home at 17. Take, take us back to your early years, please. My mother was an alcoholic and uh, she was the type of alcoholic where it held our family hostage and the uh, whole uh, 12 step fellowship of adult child of alcoholics, all that. I mean, I was a card carrying member of that or could have been. Uh, So, you know, when I was around the age of eight until I was um, 14, um, her alcohol um, drinking was very, very social and then became very private and alone and like basically within the family. And there was myself, my father and my mother. And so I saw the ravages of alcohol quickly take somebody until she finally died at the age of uh, when I was almost 15. And I remember thinking, as so many people do, wow, this is a very powerful. What was this thing that took over her? So I was still very um, devoted to trying to save her life, um, as so many um, children of alcoholics were. And it was just floored by this, what was that thing? And promised myself that I would never let that happen to me, because if nothing else, in honor of her. So that happened. And then my father um, was also... I, I don't know if he would be called an alcoholic or a heavy drinker. He, you know, we came from a German family, and uh, he was of that generation of German men who were, were in the uh, army, the German army, and was devastated when Germany lost and lived the rest of his life with that disappointment of what could have been. But it had all of the things that you wouldn't want in a, in a father, you know, very um, Nazi-like behavior, which then, after my mother died, drove me to leaving uh, at the age of 17. He also drank um, in a way that actually made him more pleasant. When he drank, it was like, oh, good. He's in a good mood tonight. Right. Um, but he did lose uh, his license, and we had, we had to sort of work around that. But it was a pleasant type as opposed to my mother's, which was very tragic. Did you have so that's siblings? Sort of, no, no, it was just the three uh, of us. Very intense then for you. Two of us. Yeah. yeah, and then finally I just left. And then once I left, it was like, oh, my God, this is just wonderful. Life is just wonderful after this. Um, and, and it has been. I mean, of course, it's been hard. I had my own issues. A childhood like that, it either breaks you or it makes you strong and independent. And yeah. I think it did the latter yeah. for you, didn't it? It certainly did the, the latter for me. Yeah. And, and, you know, people will often say, you know, what is it that makes people survive? First of all, I was a lover of reading. I loved yeah. reading books. And that uh, it, that told me there was a life other than yeah. mine uh, that was to aspire to. And that saved my life, I think. And also I had a friend, a family friend, who was all, always very uh, caring. So, you know, definitely one person can make the difference yeah. in, a, in a troubled child. Yeah. Good. So as you say, you did have your own issues, but it was more about food than the booze for you, wasn't it? That's one that I'm I'm always um, puzzled about. You know, what was first? You know, was it alcohol or was it food? And I just end up saying I think they're the same thing. When I left home, I swore I would never drink alcohol, but that didn't mean I wasn't going to take drugs. And and the drugs in those days, this was in the seventies, were uh, not the drugs of today. They were just not as dangerous. They were more in that exploratory, experimental. I loved LSD. I smoked a lot of pot. I sort of dabbled with that stuff. And then, you know, I'm young. It's a lot easier ultimately to get alcohol. So by the time I was 19, I thought, well, I made that promise to myself that I would never drink. But I did start drinking. And I saw within a couple of years how quickly my drinking was not just a couple of drinks here and there, but I always tried to get solidly drunk. It was in my... Um, university years where I saw if I want to go to school and do well in school, I can't drink. This is just not going to work. It, it, I actually started to um, not quite fail, but you know, when you're in a program where you better quit that course or else you'll fail, I would have to do that. Um, and I didn't want to keep having to navigate that. So I stopped drinking. So then um, when I stopped the alcohol, I then started eating instead. <laughs> and that 
that took me down. So when I think what started first, I think it was the alcohol. But what brought me down, brought me to my knees, begging for mercy, was food. If I think about myself as a young child, I like sugar and sweets and Halloween and Christmas like everybody else. But this kind of eating that I was doing was not enjoyable eating. It was frantic. Yeah. It was eating to numb. Just like he, exactly. you, you drink to numb. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that was um, eating and then purging and then eating. and then pur- It wasn't, it wasn't ha- a happy time. And I think it was a transfer because I actually think sugar and alcohol are very similar. Yeah, well, there's so much sugar in alcohol, isn't there? Yes. Yeah. Well, alcohol is fermented sugar. So yeah. now when I teach about alcohol and uh, sugar, I always say alcohol is basically just sugar on steroids. You're listening to a podcast from Tribe Sober. Yeah, yeah. So how did you lose the weight? How did you get to grips with the yeah. weight problem? 100 pounds, well, wasn't like, it, you shifted? Like so many of us, especially women in those days, I did the whole lose weight, gain weight, lose weight, gain weight. So, you know, I started eating frenetically, frantically in my 20s. That was the era when the eating disorder model was starting to be um, acknowledged in the in the medical world. So I would have classified, although I wasn't officially classified, I certainly behaved like somebody that would be called a bulimic. And that's what I thought I was. And I almost accepted that. I mean, of course, I would gain weight because I'm eating a lot. Uh, and then I would have to um, you know, lose that weight, which would mean restricting food. But it would always come back. Then I would start to in- introduce alcohol because I didn't know about this concept of just stop and then the, the peace of mind will come. I just thought you have to just control it. I, I found a sort of happy medium, which was not happy, but was happier, uh, where I would drink a little and eat a lot. And, uh, you know, every day or every other day, whenever I could manage for many years and steadily my weight increased to basically 250 pounds, 240 pounds. And I would lose that weight, but then gain it back. But it wasn't until I was, I guess, late 40s that maybe 50, where, where I realized maybe I should treat this like a, like a drug. And when, I fin- when that finally clicked in, and I treated especially my sugar intake, because I started with quitting sugar, if I treat that like a drug, which means I have to stop uh, and don't have a little bit once in a while, I'll be able to stop with peace. And that happened. And then over the course of maybe five years, I lost you know, 60, 70 pounds. Then I quit flour as well, because flour is almost sugar. I mean, flour as in muffins and bread and uh, pizza and stuff like that. And then I lost the, uh, almost maybe another like 80 pounds in total. And then finally, about eight years ago, um, I stopped uh, grains as well. And then I lost the whole 100 pounds and I haven't gained it back. For anybody listening, thinking, oh, my God, really? Do you have to do that? I would say it's, it's, a, it's relief compared to the way that I live yeah. uh, in my 40s, pardon me, 20s, 30s, 40s. That was miserable. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it was miserable in the sense of I don't feel well and, and my life is dominated by food. But it's also like miserable. Like if I look in the mirror, I don't want like what I see. So it's miserable every, everywhere. Obviously, there's a lot of similarities between alcohol and food, which we can talk more about. But yeah. we can stop alcohol, can't we? But food, you can't just stop it. So it sounds like over decades, you know, you gradually worked out what was causing the weight gain and, and gradually yeah. shut out whole food, food groups. So what, what do you eat today? Tell us what your normal day eating plan is. I mean, one of the things, just to answer the the point that you make about, um, you know, we can't stop eating mm. food. If, if you recognize, if I recognize, if we recognize that some foods are not foods, they're food products yes. made by the food industry, it's easier to see it as I'm actually choosing to eat food, not food products. Absolutely. And I, I get to eat a ton of stuff that I love. And so you're asking me, what do I eat? I love yogurt. I make my own yogurt. It's great. Um, I eat a lot of vegetables, you know, I eat proteins and fats, so I'm not a vegan vegetarian. I, I mean, I don't eat a lot of meat, but I do eat meat and salmon and cheese. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff and I love it. 
in my estimation, um, I see it as I no longer have to eat those things like muffins and bread uh, and, uh, you know, of course, candy and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I get to eat all this wonderful stuff. And the thing is, is I like that stuff now because yeah. I'm not eating the other. Yeah. The other dominates my palate. Yeah. Uh, so that now I can actually really enjoy the pleasure of real food. Yeah. Oh, that's a nice story. Yeah. I mean, when you go into a supermarket, we have huge supermarkets here, as I know you do. These days, I only go to a small section, you know, where they've got the fruit and the vegetables, because most of the rest, you know, it's all processed, isn't it? And it, exactly. And it's yeah. so sad, yeah. really, because before people understand and realize, you know, what, what you've been telling us, it doesn't occur to them, that, you know, they'll just pick up all sorts of stuff, put it in the trolley and give it to their families. I remember when I was a teenager, uh, like when I had left home and I got to shop for myself and actually choose what I could put. I remember putting in some of those uh, food products thinking, wow, I'm eating healthy. This is great. Yeah. You know, the vegetables and stuff. Ooh, who wants to eat that stuff? Yeah, I mean, just as an example, you, you make your own yogurts, you know, which is so different from the flavored yogurt that you'll pick up in the supermarket yeah. that is just packed with sugar and, and flavorings, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And this is coming from somebody who doesn't like to cook. I'm not a baker. I'm not a cook. I, I, I For the longest time, all I wanted to use was my microwave. But, you know, I've learned yogurt is actually very easy to make. Yes. <laughs> and roasting roasting vegetables yes. is as easy as, as using a microwave. So I've learned that. <laughs> It's actually not that RG. You don't have to be a cook to eat well. In our community, we have a lot of ladies, particularly that manage to give up drinking, but then they put on weight because they're eating so much candy and stuff. And we actually Absolutely. tell them, I hope we're giving them the right advice that, you know, they, they should rather drink, eat fresh fruit than, than candy, you know, something like mangoes and, and eat lots of fruit. Yeah. And gradually yeah. that, that fruit, they can taper that down a little bit. But I think it helps at the beginning, doesn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah it might. It, it's, it's sort of like the same argument as sweetener. Can you have sweetener? Yeah. Like if you use it as a kind of harm reduction, I'm going to use this as a bridge, but you don't want to be eating it that much all the time. But frankly, uh, I'd rather somebody eat a lot of fruit because there's only so much fruit you can have before you feel sick. You get yeah. diarrhea and you feel sick. So there, there's sort of natural curbs in place. Can we talk a bit about addiction itself? I mean, how would you define addiction and what's the science behind it? There's many um, ways to describe addiction, but probably a, a sort of two sentence description would be when, and, and this can be anything, even behavior, it doesn't have to be a substance. Any time that you have a craving for something, either alcohol, cigarette, food, love, sex, internet, um, you have a craving for something that that becomes obsessive. I, I can't stop thinking about this. It was so good. And I'd rather be doing that than what I'm doing right now, that kind of thinking, obsessive thinking that becomes impairing in your in, in your life. Like you're, you'd rather do this rather than go into work or you're, you're, you do it to the point where you can't go into work because you're feeling hungover or so bloated and sick. So obsession that leads to impairment and, and you can't control it anymore. You've lost your ability to stop. So am I obsessed with something to the point where it's affecting my life negatively and I can't stop or control it? That sense of compulsivity despite adverse consequences would be the, the quick answer. It starts with the promise that this will be fine, I'll have a drink and I'll get a nice little glow. And then eventually the brain doesn't, doesn't want you to feel that. It, it, I mean, I always say what we're talking about here is dopamine, yeah. the, the neurochemical dopamine. It's a real phenomenon that's happening in the brain. When I do something that makes me feel happy or a nice glow or a buzz, that's a little bit of extra dopamine that I'm getting dopamine being a neurochemical that we have throughout the day. I mean, here I am talking with you with interest. That's my dopamine. That's engineering me to want to know what your next question is or you, you, you with me. That's our dopamine that's working. But if we, if we take something that gives me a little bit more dopamine, then I really want to know. Like, let's say we start playing cards and we're, we, the stakes are high. I really want to know if I'm going to win or not. That's extra dopamine. And I can get that through drinking or behavior like gambling or whatever. Anyway, if I'm in that extra zone for too long, the brain will start to 
adapt to that. It doesn't want you to be there long. Yeah. It wants you to be there a little bit and then come back to normal. Homeostasis, um, thought, isn't it called? It's, it's, it's called homeostasis. You got it. And so uh, this thing called tolerance develops. And so then now you need a little bit more just, just to get that buzz or you need a bit more just to feel normal. And that's a phenomenon that happens over time. So we say addiction is a chronic progressive condition, which, which happens over time. And then at a certain point, the buzz, you don't get it anymore. Like, you just need that substance to feel normal. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. that's, uh, uh, you end up, you can't stop drinking. There's the loss of control. Yeah. Because if you stop, you're going to feel wretched. Yeah. And that is uh, uh, the sort of phenomenon of addiction. Now I'm drinking or eating or whatever. If I stop, if I continue, more impairments, more job loss, more partner getting mad at me. But if I stop, I will feel so wretched. Yeah, yeah. I can't stop. Talk about and so you, it's being behind, uh, between a rock and a hard place. That's what we call that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that's all about dopamine yeah. intolerance. Yeah. And it's a physiological thing. So when somebody says, you know, I'm a pig, I, I'm eating too much, what's wrong with me? You say, don't say that. It's, no. it, it, it's actually a phenomenon that's happening in your brain. And we have to undo that process. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I heard something talk, talking about dopamine the, the other day. Someone said to me, um, sometimes people are born with the dopamine set at a quite low level. Some people, yes. lots of people. And those are the kind of people that get a real intense uh, buzz of pleasure the first time they drink. And that's why they love to drink. Whereas other people might drink just to calm everything down a bit. And I wondered if that was true. Yeah, the, actually, the genetics of, of uh, alcohol that you've described it well, it's it's that there's some kind of dopamine um, alter, alter um, response. It, it, we look at, you know, receptors, dopamine receptors, and we see that with alcohol, uh, a person who's alcoholic, uh, the, the, there's a genetic, there seems to be a genetic predisposition where they have receptors that are different than other people. And we see that across across alcohol and food. So People who are alcoholic often have more obese uh, obesity in their family. I mean, now it's hard to tell because the whole society is obese because <laughs> yeah. of the foods that we're, we're eating. But uh, in earlier days when that wasn't quite the case, you could see that more. So it, it doesn't cross. It's, it's, it's actually another illustration of how alcohol and, and sugar are similar. But those receptors. So, yes, if, if you're born with a, a receptor, um, I guess, hypersensitivity, you're going to have a, a more effect or your receptors could be flat, and so you need something yeah, extra just yeah. to feel okay. Yeah. And it could be that there's a, a predisposition because of uh, what we call adverse childhood um, experiences. The ACE. If you've had early, early trauma in your life, uh, that's made an alteration because the brain always responds to anything good or bad. Mm. And so you've essentially probably flatten your dopamine receptors over time so that now you need something to feel yeah. just normal. And what are some, um, so some natural point, ways to, how do we boost our dopamine naturally? Basically, it's already built in. So anything like dopamine specifically is our neurochemical of anticipation and excitement. Yeah. And so you build in things that make you want to know what's going to be next. So that would be reading or, or, or going to school or going to work, sort of daily life. Yeah. Like active, be active in daily life. That's, that's before addiction. We all have a natural curiosity and a natural drive to do. It's, it's to go back and, and actually do. So that would mean not going and watching Netflix or, or TV and, and isolating People want routine, but when it's so routinized, people get very depressed. Um, you have to have a little bit of excitement or newness in life, newness. Um, but once you're uh, addicted to something and you say, well, what do I, can I do something now? Unfortunately, from addiction to normal again, there's something in between that's called withdrawal. Yes. <laughs> it's not a pleasant experience. And, and hedonia as well. I had that. Exactly. Yeah. For, yeah. Uh, and hedonia yeah. and depression yeah. and yeah, yeah. I got, I got sober seven years ago and those first few months were so difficult for me. I felt really flat and miserable. And I think because I'd been relying on alcohol to make me feel good for decades, my, my natural brain yeah. had forgotten how to do it. You have to get through that withdrawal, which is yeah. presumably what your platform is doing, is, is yeah. helping people either the long way or the short way to do that. And it's it's not a pleasant place. No. Like I, I would 
highly, highly, highly underscore highly six times um, gets get social support to yeah. do that. Yeah, and that's uh, why the community it, is so good. It was Dr. Loretta Broining, who I think you know, don't you? You've been on her podcast, yeah. certainly. She's awesome. Yes. She taught me that uh, what we really need to do in that anhedonia phase, you know, if we really feel flat, because we can't actually remember what gives us pleasure apart from drinking. Right. She said yes. that we must get a project. And what I did, mm -hmm. you know, when I was nearly a year sober is that I started Tribe Sober. So that was my project. And there was so much to yes. learn, so much to do that that's, you know, kept me buzzing ever since. But we have to find something, don't we? We can't just totally sit and wait and... No, no, absolutely not. That's, that's, yeah. I, yeah so I, t I tell a lot of my patients, you know, when they get, uh, they, they get clean and then they get housing and then now, uh, and, and, you know, and I say, okay, now, now that you've got the sort of basics, got, they've got their, their welfare check or whatever check that they, they're okay. They're not on the street anymore. It's like a sigh of relief. And then they, they go and bunker down into their little nice new little room um, and watch TV, and I say, don't do that. Mm. That's going to lead to relapse. Yeah. Because we have to get that dopamine uh, per perking. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it's so true. You can't just sit there and wait for happiness to strike. The other thing is we've got to understand that everything, life isn't perfect just because we're sober as well. Exactly. Life is still life, yeah. and it'll be half good and half bad in, in my experience. <laughs> so you have to go with the yeah. flow, really. And, you know, a, a sense of hope that uh, we, we, we can reclimatize ourselves uh, once we take away that thing that thing that has been disturbing everything which is alcohol or drug or food uh, once that's gone the body will want to readjust yeah. back to normal and then you just have to learn how to yeah. use tools so that you can yeah. live life the way it's meant to be lived yeah i mean our bodies and our brains are amazing but we just have to stop poisoning them and they'll do their job won't they that's right like you said homeostasis yeah yeah so we talk about comfort eating a lot, don't we? Do you think we comfort drink? Yes. Those of us who eat well love our food. So this is not, but I don't eat for comfort. I eat for the pleasure of the meal and for feel I'm hungry and I'm filling up, but I'm not seeking uh, comfort because I'm feeling depressed. I mean, I might, if I'm hungry and I'm depressed, be happy that I had my meal, but I, I, I didn't specifically drink or eat uh, to, to feel comfort. But uh, alcohol um, and food products share a, a unique combination of neurochemicals. We've talked about dopamine, uh, but we've all we didn't talk. But and I just want to add that there's also serotonin and endorphins that are also triggered with alcohol and with food. Alcohol is kind of like a universal. It covers all of our quote happy chemicals that like yeah. Loretta Burning. Burning for example, talks about the happy chemicals of alcohol, serotonin, and endorphin. And I think she includes oxytocin in there too. Yeah. But anyway, it alcohol covers them all. So uh, it's super easy to get uh, what we call a, a quick, easy yeah. fix. Uh, rather than doing all the things I need to do in life uh, to, to get that comfort, I just have a drink of alcohol or eat food. They share this, that same thing. And uh, endorphins specifically are our pain reliever. And if we're in pain and need comfort, it's often because well, we're hurting either psychically or physically. And uh, endorphin, which is basically an opiate, uh, it's our own personal stash of opiate, that would be like taking a pain pill uh, if, if I'm hurting. Well, I can take a pain drink, that's alcohol, yeah. or a pain food, which is sugar, and that will actually make me feel, it doesn't take the pain away, it just numbs yeah. it. You yeah. use that word, numb, numbs it. And a classic example for somebody who's going, okay, what does that look like? Uh, in the days when I did drink, uh, I needed to have at least to have a bottle of wine or maybe a bottle of wine at night to get to sleep, to chill, to just whatever. When I stopped drinking, I needed to have my stash of candies at night to fall asleep. Yeah. And as I'm, as I'm eating the ice cream, I'm thinking about the day, but it's becoming more distant and it's still there, but I don't care as much anymore. It's like I'm cold and numb to that experience. That's the endorphin kicking in. Yeah. And so the sleeping, um, I know what you mean now. I used to drink wine in the evening and, and just kind of go to sleep quite quite nicely, but obviously uh, awake at three o'clock, racked with anxiety. Yes. And then, yes, exactly. uh, you know, a lot of us, when we give up, we really struggle to sleep for a while. 
because uh, oh absolutely yeah alcohol alcohol destroys the sleep structure and and when people go into withdrawal unfortunately uh, uh, sh- uh sleeping is one of the last things to kick back into place like it takes about a year um to get back back into order and sometimes longer than a year but you know yeah but it then took me many years then it comes back I'm and just, what is it we get seven cycles of rem instead of two which we get when we're drinking yeah. something like that anyway absolutely. yeah absolutely yeah yeah. You're listening to a podcast from Tribe Sober. If you'd like to join our warm and welcoming community, just head on over to tribesober.com and hit the membership tab. That's www.tribesober.com. What about menopausal years? Are they a bit of a danger time for overeating and overdrinking? Those of us who have gone through menopause know that it's pretty disturbing. Yeah. But for those who have not yet, just think about what was it like when you were a teenager and, yeah. and, and hormones were raging. It's the same similar thing. It's it's there's another hormonal shift, climate change, as it were, uh, happening, and it, and it's just as devastating as being a teenager in a different way. Uh, plus, then you're also facing uh, you know the the next chapter of your life, which is often kind of scary for people. There's something that's almost like a switch is turned off in in menopause, and that people who were eating well with whatever they were eating and their weight was fine, find that now their weight starts to gain, and especially if they're drinking, their weight starts to gain, even if they were managing before with exercise or whatever else they were doing. For example, myself, I remember I told you my gradual progression, I quit sugar, I quit flour, and then actually when I hit um, 50, 55, I had to take grains out because I started to gain weight. Even though it's like, why? I'm not, I'm not eating sugar anymore. Come on, body, stop doing this. And when I stopped um, the grains, which are like rice and quinoa and stuff that seems healthy, and it was healthy, uh, then I lost that stubborn 20 pounds that I couldn't lose before. Um, so now I don't eat grains anymore. I think that of menopause, not only are we faced with all of the stresses of the fears of aging and all that and you know partners and you know am I still attractive all that kind of stuff but also there's a physiological change uh, and so I have to watch even more about what carbohydrates I'm eating that appears to be the case for a lot of women yeah so we have to be extra careful and sensitive to what's going on don't we yes yes we've got a few people in our community that have had this gastric band Oh, procedure yes. and they tell me that before that operation they had no issue with alcohol it was all about the food but now it's all about the alcohol is that a kind of cross addiction going on there what is it yeah they give a very good i mean they're a very good illustration of how alcohol is just you know the big sister or big brother of sugar so you know i mean again it's just fermented sugar but with all the impact um and plus like i said alcohol and steroids so It's a very good example, a person who has bariatric surgery, because what's happened with bariatric surgery is the the two two main things in in the various versions of surgery. The absorption of nutrients is significantly reduced and also the volume of, of food. So here I am and here you are going to the grocery store, eating our vegetables and, you know, vegetables are bulky They're because of the fiber, the water, the fluid, whatever. Uh, and, you know, the, the steak or whatever it is that you're eating, it's bulky. If you cut your stomach down or, or reduce your stomach size significantly, you can't eat that stuff anymore. You're almost forced to eat food products, processed foods that have been mashed up. Unless you blenderize your food, which most people don't do. They'll just get the protein shakes and the whatevers uh, that, there's, that they've been told to get. Uh, so you can't literally eat the good stuff anymore. You're almost forced to eat the bad stuff. And what's the biggest bad stuff? Alcohol, because again, that's just yeah. that's liquid. Yeah. So um, and so so there's that. It, it, your, your body's going to preferentially choose what it can take, which is that. And then secondly, what's absorbed? Well, it's going to absorb the easiest stuff, which is the liquid and the soft uh, pot, like the um, soda sugars that are like candies that you know melt into your mouth and then they become sugar small intestine is going to absorb that first so it's going to uh, over food so a person that drinks um, alcohol eating with a meal that has not had gastric bypass or whatever type of surgery they will um, have maybe one glass over the course of an hour that's fine 
but the, the gastric bypass person, that alcohol goes to those uh, the, to the small intestine before anything else, and it it's equivalent to two or three glasses of wine. Right. So there you are thinking you're having a couple of glasses of wine when in fact you're having equivalent to a bottle of wine. It doesn't take long before you know the whole receptor business and tolerance and all that stuff develops. So they have they they develop an addiction. So bearing all that in mind, Vera, would you advise a very overweight person against gastric uh, surgery? This is this is a bit of a dicey question. Mm. If it's not necessary, absolutely not. So first of all, if the person is willing, the, the two, there's two uh, issues. If the person is willing to change their diet, then no. If they're willing to change their diet, so that's one issue. The second one is, do they have time to lose weight? Because it took me, when I lost that 100 pounds, it wasn't like all in three months. It was, it was over the course of maybe two or three or four years. I had that time to wait. My weight at 250 was not dangerous. Now, if you're 350 pounds, 400 pounds, and you've got diabetes and heart disease and all sorts of things, you may not have time to lose that weight. Bariatric surgery promise weight loss, usually significant within the year. And so if you don't have the time, then I would say, okay, do it because we want you to be alive. Don't do it if you're going to continue eating because you'll lose that weight and you'll gain it back again. Maybe not the full amount, but you will gain it back again. Yeah. Um, so if you don't have the time, do it, but then change your diet. If you do have the time, try first without the surgery because there's a tremendous amount of uh, negative side effects. Yeah. And sometimes these interventions like medication and surgery are short-term solutions. Do it if you have yeah. to. But if you don't have to, you will get the same result just by following a, yeah. a, a, a yeah. different diet. If you're alcoholic, I don't know if you're going to ask me this question, uh, or drinking a little bit and you try to quit sugar, it's better to quit both. I guess, I guess that's my bottom statement there. Yeah. Quit them both and you'll be in peace of mind. Yeah. I know that you help people to lose weight. So talk, talk to us about what you do. There was a time before COVID Thanks to a wonderful donor in my treatment center where I worked, we were able to introduce a food addiction program, which was just amazing. So people actually went in. It was a residential treatment center, stayed for a month. Uh, you know, we locked them up so they couldn't eat their candies on the side. And whenever we, they went out, we looked in their purse to make sure there weren't chocolate bars in there. You know, the same as we did with uh, the other, other addicts, uh, to make sure they didn't have a cocaine stash or something in their purse. Anyway, that kind of a vigilance meant that people had a protected space for a month. And that's really all it takes, folks, to get through the worst of it. Yeah. And that, that was wonderful. I loved that. That's what I did then. I'm now uh, working with other therapists, mostly virtually, and mainly it's through virtual programs using the same tools, the addiction tools. And community, community, community is so important uh, and support that. What I do on my own is I have a Facebook group, a free Facebook group, which, again, provides community and information. It's just another resource to uh, give people hope, inspiration, and also community. One thing I want to say here, this isn't my phrase, but it's a phrase that we use in the addiction community all the time. The opposite of addiction is connection. <laughs> you have to be connected. Yeah. It's, uh, if you're isolated, you're just fighting a losing battle. Like the, the, we are social creatures. And when it comes to food, which is such a primal mm -hmm. need, we need to have the hand of somebody beside us to say, it's okay, Vera, you're going to do this. You don't need it. You've got me and, you know, whatever. It, it, it's, we need that. So, the, so I do that. I have the Facebook group. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. The community thing. I mean, we need not only guidance, yes. you know, from the experts, but we need people that are further down the road that can say things like, yeah. oh, yeah, when I was three weeks, I, I was really suffering, but it gets better. I, I, Hang in there. Yeah. I can't think how important that yeah. is. Yeah. In fact, it's probably more important than medications. If, if, if somebody's listening that's on an antidepressant, connection is more powerful than, than your antidepressant. It, it's, it's equivalent or more. Yeah. Yeah. Super. Yeah, I agree. Isolation's the worst and and people do tend to isolate. Certainly when I was at my very worst as an alcohol dependent, my world got very small, you know. I wasn't really interested in anything else because first of all my drinking was very social and then it became very lonely. I just wanted to be exactly. with with the alcohol. That was that was my best friend. Right. <laughs> 
exactly. Yeah. And for somebody who's eating too, you know, it's like I'd rather have my tub of ice cream and my show at night than go out. Yeah, yeah. And it and that's yeah. the, or I, I, a bottle of wine or whatever. Yeah, and it's so- I'm having. A, I don't need people. They will say, yeah. "Yes, we do need yeah. people, folks." Yeah, we do. We do. <laughs> Yeah, I was interested when you said that that month, you know, was um, was the worst of it. But I think as we're yeah. beginning that month, it's so hard, isn't it, to imagine that it's going to be OK. And somehow we have to give people hope, don't we, to, to just do the work, yes. hang in there and yes. it'll get better. You know, within months, your life changes. But there is exactly. a really tough bit at the beginning. If I want to make an analogy, it's a bit like chemotherapy, like it, it could save your life. Yeah. And yes, it's going to be miserable. Build in that that month, like some people do it by going to a treatment center, but you don't have to do that. And then just take the bitter pill every yeah. day of I'm not going to have this thing, but it will get better. Yeah. It really will. Yeah. That's, that's the promise. Yeah, it's a good analogy. I've been through chemotherapy as well, so I agree with that one. Uh, and I'm still here. <laughs> yes, you are. And you're probably still here because you're not eating crap and you're not drinking because that stuff makes cancer, feeds it. I know. Feeds it. Yeah, let's talk about yeah. that a little bit. Because when I got breast cancer in 2006, I'd been on a bottle of wine a night for a couple, oh. couple of decades. Had no idea there was any link to cancer. I mean, it yes. never occurred to yes. me. And even, you know, I went through my chemotherapy and all that, you know, mastectomy, radiotherapy, the lot. They throw the book at it, but I survived. And then I remember saying to the oncologist, you know, do I have to change my eating or my drinking? And he said, no, no. You know, he said, no, he said, there's nothing wrong with the odd glass of wine, my dear. But of course, I heard I can go back to my usual intake. And I did. It is yes. important to realize that there's a, it's linked to seven different types of cancer now, isn't it, alcohol? Yes. Yeah. And, you know, in Canada, um, I don't know if this is worldwide. I suspect it's not. But in Canada, you know, what we call the safe drinking guidelines were always like, you know, what's considered safe for somebody who's not an alcoholic um, would be like for a female, one to two drinks a day, tops to one. Um, a day. But actually now uh, this, the, the guidelines have changed. Uh, this is like in the last three mm-hmm. or four months um, where it's like two, one or two in a week. Yeah, yeah. And, and that difference, that difference between one or two a day to one a week was because we we're acknowledging the, the impact of alcohol on uh, feeding cancer. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, no, another piece of information I want to throw out there, because cancer certainly is a scary prospect, but another one, maybe because of my age, I'm postmenopausal, is Alzheimer's. And we're now yeah. recognizing the clear link between sugar and Alzheimer's. So if you don't want this horrible thing that's happening to parents and, you know, colleagues around you, stop the damn sugar. And that means stopping the alcohol. Yeah, yeah. Every Saturday afternoon, we open up our Tribe Sober Zoom Cafe. It's a safe space where our members can connect, check in, and just shoot the breeze about alcohol-free living. If you'd like to be a guest at the cafe one Saturday, just drop us an email at janet at tribesober.com. That's janet, J-A-N-E-T, at tribesober.com, and we'll send you an invitation. So imagine there's someone listening to this, Dr. Vera, that's struggling with addiction, food, alcohol, whatever, and they just don't know where to start. What would you recommend to them? What should be the first step? Well, the first step is recognizing that that, that this is a condition that is not your fault. It's like it's not a moral failing. It's not because you don't have enough willpower. It's because something has happened in your brain. Unfortunately for you, uh, maybe it's because of a predisposition or previous past experiences, but your brain has now gotten hooked. It's like you've gotten cancer. Like you've gotten something now that's called uh, addiction. It's a phenomenon that's happening to the brain. You can help that for sure, but it's not your fault. I, I mean, you may have contributed to it, but there it is. It's a, it's a condition. It's not because you should just buckle up and get better on your own. So once you recognize that, then the next thing is, okay, if it's an addiction, what's the best solution? You can go slowly and try to go off slowly. It's going to be hard. It's actually a lot easier to just quit cold yeah. turkey. The next step is you want to stop this stuff because it's a chronic progressive condition. You don't want it to get worse. So that means ultimately, either now or later, you're going to have to stop. But that's hard to do. 
So that because remember number one, which is it's a condition. So it's a condition. I have to stop. So what do I do now? Well, you start getting information like like listening to this podcast and you know going on the on the uh, website, reading the book. You can read my book, Food Junkies. Get get information, then get help, and that could be through getting a coach. That could be through a twelve step program. That could be through a, a web program. It could be something you want to get help. Whatever you've done has not worked. So there's new tools that you're not aware of that you don't even know do work that are out there. And then finally, 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 uh, get support. Yeah. The support is so important because you're going to have weak moments and you need to have strong people to boost you up in that weak moment. And then maybe actually one more point is I would like to give people hope. It is possible. Yeah. There are people who feel like they were hopeless and, and there's no way. 400 plus pounds, eating all that. There's no way. And they actually su- uh, succeed. There is hope. It is possible if you do all the uh, things that are uh, are recommended to you. Um, yeah, there is hope. And then and then you'll be free. It's not a life of deprivation. Absolutely. You are now living Absolutely. a life of deprivation. Yeah. It's a life of freedom. Yeah. I always say to yeah. people, this isn't a lifetime struggle. Do the work oh. for a few months and you're, you're free. Your book's called Food Junkies. Your Facebook yes. group, what's that called? Yeah, so the book is called Food Junkies Recovery from Food Addiction. Uh, and it's about ad- food, but it's also about addiction in general. Okay. Because food is a case point. I have a website called addictionsunplugged.com. And to tell you the truth, I'm not that active on the website anymore. I'm much more active on my Facebook group, which is called I'm Sweet Enough, Sugar Free for Life. There's lots of uh, resources on there, plus a great support system. I also am part of a team. There's three of us who do a a podcast called Food Junkies Podcast, where we interview lots of the people in the field. Every interview that I do, including hopefully this one, I don't know if you want me to use it, I post on YouTube. What's that one called? Food Junkies? No, just Vera Tarman. Vera Tarman. Thank you, Vera. So interesting to hear the similarities between alcohol and sugar addiction. I think I'll always remember your description of alcohol as sugar on steroids. Let's pull out some key points from that conversation. Vera had a difficult childhood. Her mother was an alcoholic who died when Vera was just 15. And her relationship with father was not good. So she left home at 17. She was actually floored by the speed of her mother's decline and vowed that she would never go there. She would never drink. However, she did take drugs. She mentioned LSD and pot, but also stresses that this was back in the 70s when drugs were not quite as toxic as they are today. But in spite of her good intentions, by the age of 19, she'd switched from drugs to alcohol. And within a couple of years, the alcohol had taken hold and she would always drink to get solidly drunk. She realised that she would never get through college if she carried on drinking. So she managed to stop. But when she stopped drinking, she started eating. And it was the food that brought her down, as she puts it. Her eating had nothing to do with enjoyment. She was making herself numb, eating and purging. She describes it as frantic. With hindsight, she can say that her addiction to alcohol had simply transferred to her eating habits. And of course, there is so much sugar in alcohol. Dr. Vera describes alcohol as sugar on steroids. In her 20s, she was stuck in the dieting yo-yo, losing the weight and then gaining it back, eventually gaining 100 pounds. She was bulimic. She reintroduced alcohol to her diet and tried to control it. But as she says, back then she had no idea of the peace of mind she could gain by ditching it altogether. Her weight continued to increase until she hit 250 pounds. She would lose the weight and regain the weight and it wasn't until her late 40s that she had a breakthrough. That was when she accepted that sugar was also an addiction She couldn't just have a little now and again. She would have to quit it completely. And over the course of the next few years, she went on to lose 60 or 70 pounds. And after the sugar, she quit flour, bread, muffins, pizza, etc. 
By doing that, she lost another £80. And finally, she quit grains and lost the rest of her excess weight, never gaining it back. She describes losing the weight as a great relief, as it had been making her so miserable and she never felt healthy or well. In fact, she stresses that addicts mustn't fear living a life of deprivation. If you're an addict or alcohol dependent, you're living a life of deprivation now. So reach out, get help and find freedom. You can reach out to Tribe Sober by going to tribesober.com and hitting join our tribe. We talked about the fact that with alcoholism, we can quit alcohol completely but we obviously have to eat some food. And Vera made the very interesting point that she hadn't quit food, but she had quit food products, processed food in other words. Vera's approach of gradually shutting out various food groups is an interesting one. When I asked her what she did eat, she listed some of the things that she eats on a daily basis, yogurt, cheese, salmon, meat, vegetables, She spoke of her pleasure in eating these foods and she doesn't feel at all deprived. As she puts it, she feels relief she doesn't have to eat bread or sugar anymore. She can enjoy real food instead. And her palate has switched from craving sugar and carbs to appreciating healthy food. Vera is not a cook, but she stresses that it's quite easy to eat well. As an example, yogurt is easy to make and vegetables are easy to roast. I explained that we give our community advice to eat fresh fruit rather than candy if they are craving sweet things in early sobriety. And if you'd like more info on the science behind this advice, then listen to Tribe Sober podcast episode 31 from January 2021 and you'll hear nutritionist Mary Ann Shearer explaining... Vera describes addiction as a craving which leads to an obsession which then becomes impossible to stop. We should ask ourselves, am I obsessed with something that's affecting my life negatively? She explained how we can go from enjoying a gentle buzz to wanting a drink to needing a drink, needing more and more to get the same result. And continual use of alcohol can flatten our dopamine receptors so that we eventually need alcohol just to feel normal. She also explained that some people get a more intense buzz of pleasure when they drink. And if your dopamine receptors are naturally flat, you may need something to feel okay. So I asked Dr. Vera how we can boost our dopamine naturally. She explains that before addiction, our dopamine is built in. It's about anticipation and looking forward to the next thing. And we all have a natural curiosity that makes us want to try new things. That's why we encourage tribe members to get a project to keep that dopamine triggered. We both agreed that social support is essential in early sobriety. We can't just isolate and watch TV. We have to connect with others and get that dopamine perking. And that's why a project that connects you with other people works so well. We talked about using sugar and alcohol to numb our feelings. And the fact that junk food and alcohol will release endorphins which block pain. And that's why it can numb our feelings. Dr. Vera says that alcohol destroys our sleep structure and it can take as long as a year for normal sleep patterns to resume. But they will resume, and your sleep will be wonderful, so hang in there. We talked about menopause, which Vera describes as a storm of hormones. It's almost like being a teenager again. She also said that it's a time when many women put on weight. They become very sensitive to carbohydrates and even if they were controlling their weight when they were younger, it's like a switch has been flipped. We're just more prone to weight gain when we hit menopause, especially if we're drinking. We talked about bariatric surgery and the fact that many people do become addicted to alcohol when they've addressed their weight issue with this surgery. 
Vera explained that one glass of wine will be the equivalent to three after this surgery, so it's not difficult to become dependent. There are so many negative side effects to this surgery that it should only be used if the weight has become life-threatening. Far better to tackle the eating. We talked about the fact that alcohol is now linked to seven different types of cancer and also Alzheimer's. Vera's advice to people who are struggling is to accept that you have a condition. Something has happened in your brain to cause this addiction. It's not your fault. Educate yourself. Read books. Listen to podcasts. Accept that you'll have to stop completely. Whatever you've been trying hasn't worked, so get some help. You heard her stressing the essential need to join a community, so please check out Tribe Sober. We've got the tools and the group support to keep you on track. Just go to tribesober.com and hit join our tribe. And finally, Vera wanted to stress that whatever the addiction, there is hope. And indeed, we both know so many people who've succeeded in overcoming both alcohol and food addiction. To learn more about Dr. Vera, you can read her book, Food Junkies. Join her Facebook group, which is called I Am Sweet Enough, Sugar Free for Life. She also has a podcast, the Food Junkies podcast, and she has a YouTube channel where she stores all her interviews. So let me end with a message from one of our chat rooms. This one is from Kay in the US, who's on our Path to Purpose program. My belief was that alcohol enabled me to disappear from my world, which then meant I didn't have to deal with any responsibilities, issues and emotions. Of course, I now know that my life was still going on and all those things I wanted to disappear from were still there, waiting for me, patiently, with a smirk on their face. So when I woke up in the morning... All those things I disappeared from the night before were thrown into my face and needing to be dealt with, with an awful hangover on top of it. Plus, I was treated to a huge dose of shame, guilt, remorse and self-hate as the cherry on the top. Such an awful life. I am now so much happier after ditching the alcohol. I don't want or need to disappear because I am worth being seen. I am able to take on my responsibilities, handle issues and feel my emotions without alcohol. Well done, Kay. That is so true. Well done to you and to everyone else who's connecting at such a deep level on our Path to Purpose program. On Monday, 5th of June, we begin our fifth five-day free boot camp on our Facebook group. Five days of tasks, training and connection, all absolutely free. We've got more and more tribe members finding us via our free boot camps. They quit the booze during the boot camp and usually join Tribe Sober to stay connected and to keep on track. All you have to do is join the Sobriety Boot Camp Facebook group and you're in. I'll see you there. That's it from me. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back next week. Ditching the drink is like climbing a mountain. It's hard, it takes courage and grit, and an experienced guide. And that's where we come in. Here at Tribe Sober, we've climbed that mountain, and we know the view from the top is amazing. We've used our experience to put together a unique membership program that will support you all the way. We've got challenges, chat rooms, sober buddies, trackers, and milestone awards, and that's just for starters. So head on over to tribesober.com and check out our membership program. It's the essential resource for anyone looking to ditch the drink and change their life.